Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome again to another stream. It's great to see you here. Today I have a really fantastic topic, something which will be magnificent. It is ant social structure. Before we get into things, um, let me kind of give you a bit of background as to how we ended up with this stream because you might think it's a bit of a departure from what we normally do on this channel. Normally it's mythology, Tolkien and fantasy, maybe some history, with a little bit of science fiction, and looking at politics. But a few months ago, I did a stream on chimpanzee uh, power politics, and I was using a, um, a kind of approach developed by Deval, and a case study which he conducted looking at the what you would call the political dynamics of a chimp group and using this to illustrate and perhaps inform our understanding of elite theory and human political arrangements certainly focusing on the idea that coalitions and building coalitions is the key to political success and what kinds of coalitions you would want to build for success. And this seemed to get a very positive reaction. People really enjoyed this stream. And so ever since that point, I've been thinking about how could we do another stream looking at the natural world, looking at the, um, I guess, the social systems or political systems of other creatures to again inform our own understanding of our own context and our own uh, societies. I was a bit reticent of doing another uh, mammal or especially another ape but certainly another mammal because while there would be some differences with the chimps it seemed that in in reality many of the lessons would be very similar and we wouldn't be able to learn too much from them any more than the chimpanzees so i thought well wouldn't it be interesting to go to the very opposite end of the spectrum to see a political and social structure in nature, which is almost the opposite from the chimpanzee. And maybe, maybe we might learn some very different things from it, or even just see some very different things. Perhaps it will show us more clearly what's different about us and about our social structure. But there may be other things that we think, oh, we can tap into that in a way that we wouldn't have uh, with the chimpanzees. And so this idea of doing an ant stream has kind of been on the back burner for a while. And then last month, uh, my members for the first time got the opportunity to vote on what, what this stream would be. One, once per month, the members get a choice. And uh, they decided to go for this. So that's why we've got ant social structures. So I, I, I'm very much looking forward to this. And if it, you know, we could we could blame the members uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Democracy brought us this situation. Um, but before we get into it, let me encourage you to please like and comment and subscribe. It makes a big difference to the channel. And if you want to send a super chat, please feel free to. I'll make sure to address those. If there's any other comments or questions at the end of the stream, uh, I'll uh, try and get to them as I can. And I have a little challenge for you all in the chat. So you'll see the pinned message is to come up with your best, your best pun, politically, a political pun about ants. You get, we've already got one, yeah, or well, I suppose we've got two, but we've got one here from Jay Green River. Let me highlight it first. You're really putting me on the stop. I was just droning about. That made me chuckle. That made me chuckle. And of course, Vingal already has picked up on Magnificent. This is going to be a Magnificent stream. So yeah, if you have any, put them in the chat and we'll have a review at the end of the show. Um, but yes, it's good to see you all. And uh, I've prepared a little a little presentation to go with this. Oh, we've already moved on to the, from the first slide. So yes, we're going to be looking at ants. And uh, I've said become the bug man. Obviously, many people will know this, this idea in our sphere of the bug man who lives in his pod, who consumes what he has to and does his little role, functions within the society in a certain way. 
And well, it's got two it's two meanings. On the one hand, part of this living in the pod idea in this future that the the various elite NGOs wants us to follow, like the World Economic Forum, is a move away from uh, meats like steak and gammon and but you know uh, because these are seen as producing too much uh, greenhouse gases, methane and so on, to and and also because they're consuming too much of the world's land, and moving to an insect diet. So that's one side of it. But the other is, well, in this sort of system where you are essentially a cog in a machine, are you not like a bug or an insect? And that's one of the things I want to, you to hold in your mind as we go through this uh, together. So I think there's four kind of key areas that I've drawn from the literature uh, on, on ant societies, and we'll go through each of them in turn. So the first is going to be eusocial and superorganism. Uh, you know, these concepts, these are the kind of key ideas for defining ant social structures. Then we'll move into kind of what that means for the structure of the society, particularly in its division of labor and with its castes. Third, we'll look at the ways that ants communicate and how this is key to their what you might call the, the emergent properties of ant colony action. And then finally, we're going to look at how some creatures manipulate ant division of labor and communication strategies to their own advantage. Now, as a kind of precursor, one of the things I want to say immediately is, well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about this because whereas the chimpanzees their society is relatively easy to analyze. You can look at a bunch of chimps living together in a zoo or a safari park, and you can observe their interactions. And these can be scaled across all different kinds of chimpanzee society. There's not much variation. By contrast, with ants, well, there are 13,000 known species of ant. And it's guessed or estimated that there's 22,000 in total. What that means then is there's a lot of variety. You think that there's a, a rule for ants in general on one point, so maybe there's a certain behavior you, you observe in many species, and there'll be one species which goes against that. There'll be a certain set of uh, social distinctions or castes in across many, but then others won't have them. So it's very difficult to generalize or universalize a lot of these things with ants. There's so much variety. But second, uh, observing ants is not so easy as looking at a, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of chips in a zoo. They, they have to be in very certain conditions to do observation upon them. But then third, and probably more most important, Importantly, sorry, ants don't have the intentionality which seems to go with politics. With the chimpanzees at the very beginning of the video, I showed a, a clip from a BBC program where the chimps, a group of male chimps, were hunting uh, a monkey for food. And it showed how they used strategy they were able to make a plan and execute it together and this required a degree of intuition i, I would say uh, an ability to see into the future and imagine what another creature is seeing and it's kind of projecting its possible route and then working around that and responding in the moment to changes to that plan this also then impacted their political uh, relationships, their attempts to build coalitions with very purposeful behaviors to undermine another chimp's authority through very purposeful behaviors, all with certain goals that they're striving towards, the elevation of their own status, perhaps even becoming the alpha male. Whereas ants don't have that. When you look at ant behavior, it's not as if each ant is has a its own will 
and is able to structure its own actions according to a set of goals that it's decided upon or it, it intuits. So that's why I've called this social systems rather than political, because there doesn't seem to be that means goals relationship in the same way and that sense of intuition or reasoning with an ant. It's much more, well, we'll come to it, but it, it seems much more like a res stimuli and response system. It's like something happens and the ant responds in a certain way. So I think a social system is a, a better model for it. So with that said and done, let us move to uh, getting into it. So what is eusociality? Well, it's a way of characterizing a group of creatures and their social structure. And eusocial means truly social. It's the eu be, in Greek being true or good, as in eudaimonia, right? So a eusocial structure is a very specific kind, and it seems to have these three uh, properties within the literature. One is that there is a division between reproductive and non-reproductive castes. So certain gr members of a group will have exclusive privileges in mating and producing the young, while there will be others in the group who do not uh, produce any young. And it's a very hard line. It's not just uh, it's not just that you're unable to mate, right, or that you fail to get a partner. It's that that's not your role within the society. Think of something like uh, A Brave New World by Algis Huxley, where there are certain humans who are allowed to reproduce and or their genes will be used for reproduction. And there's others who will not. I think that's in A Brave New World. If not, you get the idea, right? Um, or you could even go, no, no, I was, I was going to say Plato, but his is more uh, certain people with certain moral characteristics should uh, mate, but there's not this distinction of the reproductive caste and the non-reproductive. Second to eusociality is that it's a multi-generational community that you have Creatures born over several generations living and working together. Now, you could definitely say that of a human family, for example. Certainly in the old days, prior to modernity, extended families where you had grandparents and maybe aunts and uncles and cousins, that would be a, more eusocial than the nuclear family, which only has two generation, generations, really, within it. Um, but then a broader community would be multi-generational, right? And then finally, that there's a cooperative raising of the young. It's not just left to the parents, as it is in our, uh, well, in modernity, essentially. It's actually the whole group is involved, or certain members of the group are involved. Think of uh, in Sparta, ancient Sparta, that children were taken from their parents and raised by the community by the, the state, essentially. Maybe we're moving that way. That would be more like it. So eusociality requires all three of these. It's not good enough just to have one or two. You need to have all three. Uh, in terms of mammals, the closest thing we have is actually this really beautiful creature that you can see on the screen, the naked mole rat. Naked mole rats live in groups together. They, the top pair, uh, the male and female, have exclusive rights to mating. The rest uh, don't mate. And they tend to the young of the this top couple, the alpha and uh, matriarch. Others like it might be meerkats and certain forms of mongoose. You have similar things. But again, I, I think it's important to say here, their inability to mate how to put it, it's not intrinsic to any of these creatures. Like if the alpha male died, another male could take that role. By contrast, in insect societies, this seems to be much more hard and fast. And it, seemed, it seems in bees, wasps, 
termites and ants, these all are eusocial to varying degrees. Some are much more primitive in the language that's used, and we'll get into that. Other, other more complex uh, social structures are, you could almost say, pure eusociality. They are the best exemplifications of these principles. But there's, a, there's something further to this, because these properties of eusociality all underpin another aspect of the ant society. And this is, this is a little bit more contested, I think, in the literature from what I've read. But certain scholars want to describe ants as a super organism, that the colony is a super organism. Now, what does this mean? Well, each of us are an organism made up of thousands, millions of cells, right? And these cells by themselves are alive and they are have their own structure and their own integrity and their own teleology. They have a purpose and they fulfill it. Now, alone, these cells would die off. But together, these cells produce something more than the sum of their parts. Together, they constitute an organism and work towards the sustenance and maintenance and flourishing of the organism. They don't exist for themselves. They exist for, well, for me and for you, right? So a superorganism, take that idea of a creature and a, a unit, a whole made up of many, many parts. But whereas parts in an organism are a cell, in a superorganism, they are independent creatures or animals. And each of these animals is a part of this greater whole or unit which exists for itself. So in the case of ants, each ant by, you know, is equivalent to a cell in a human being, we might say. But whereas the cell is not an animal, an ant is actually its own independent being. But with all of the other ants in a colony, it forms something much more complex, which exists for itself and in its own right. We see this in the fact that many ants will sacrifice themselves for the good of the colony, that they will put themselves in harm's way to ensure that the colony survives. And it is there's no question about it. Now, we could get into debates well, they can't reason and so on. But I think the point more is the ant's total purpose in life is the maintenance and growth of its colony. It has no intrinsic value to itself. All its actions, all it does is so that this, the super organism of the colony is successful and thrives. And so when it comes to analyzing competition, it's not really we're looking at colonies against colonies when it's coming to evolution or natural selection it's the development of a colony rather than the individual ant which is the key because the development of the ant is really tied to the development of this super organism so this is this is quite an interesting idea in relation to human beings because some scholars would try to say that we are super organisms or society can become a super organism in that many animals who are independent in one way or another through cooperation through forming well in in terms of working together could be made into a super organism of society I think we can kind of understand this idea a wee bit better by looking again very briefly at Max Weber's uh, analysis of political systems. So for Weber, I guess the key, um, the, the two key systems really are the one that's based on the charismatic leader and the bureaucratic system. The charismatic leader is an individual, say in a primitive tribe, like a warrior or a priest, 
who, because of his personality and because of his mission, so whether that's to extend the territory, to bring in wealth through plunder, or to reveal divine mysteries, is able to gain the loyalty of those who, who are in the tribe. And they will follow this individual and do as he says or she says. And so this individual can then, what, what forms the, the rules of the society, what's done in the society, are determined by the personal decision of this individual. And so it's organized around fulfilling the mission of this person, or maybe it could be a group. If this person dies, the society either has to formalize what the leader said and kind of carry it on into a new, um, almost like an, an abstracted code, or they need a new leader. And again, they follow this individual. You could see this is a little bit like Carlyle's uh, hero worship, where an individual of such greatness evokes in us admiration, loyalty, obedience, and love, and we will do whatever to serve them. And indeed, in a previous video on the stream, I've suggested that in many ways, religion is like this. Although we talk about doctrine and so on, actually, when you look at all the major religions, they all have a a figurehead, a spokesman, a person in the past or in the present who is the mediator of belief and practice. So that's one system where it's very much about personal relationship and its survival, its purpose is the fulfillment of the leader's wishes. The bureaucratic system for Weber is very unlike this. It's maintained and produced by a class of experts who enter this profession through the passing of examinations and the gaining of technical knowledge. And with their expertise, they administer a system based on a set of rules or principles, independent of personal judgment removing personal advantage from the system. And in so doing, they seek, I guess you could call them administrators or managers, they seek to maintain and grow this system, keep it alive as long as possible, and indeed to fortify it as much as possible. And each of, so, so in this system, the individuals don't really matter too much. If somebody tries to go against it, you just replace them with a new administrator. You can carry on the work. What matters is the system. Everything else serves the system in the bureaucratic, in the technocratic state. That's the purpose. So the, the humans are instruments within this system. I think that's more like a superorganism because the system in some sense has its own higher integrity than its parts. Whereas you could say in the personal system, the one that demands loyalty and personal relationship, the individual parts are identical with the, the, with the rationale of the system of government in that, to a certain extent anyway. So with that, um, and uh, well, and, and uh, here, here's a good point, because I think it, it's worth saying, because Vingles just mentioned in the chat, the queen ant. So th this is a key point. Although they're called queen ants, right? I think this is actually a bad term, because in our system, a queen or a king, a monarch is somebody whose orders you follow. Or it ought to be in a in a you know in a genuine monarchy. Their decision determines the law in the land. Their decision determines what the subjects do. But a queen ant doesn't function like that. An ant doesn't go up to the queen and ask what to do and get told what to do. Nor does the queen really direct the ants to any in any major way. Rather, 
the queen exists to perform a certain function within the system. She is there to reproduce. She is there to produce the eggs, which will hatch the workers, who in turn provide food and defense for the queen and future eggs. It's about her role, her purpose, her role, is to ensure a key part of the system is maintained and to produce all those who will be able to maintain the system. So she is not a queen in a human sense. She is a, a cog in a machine. And so much so that if the queen, uh, if, a, if an older queen lays eggs which produce new younger queens, it's quite often because, because these younger queens will be able to produce uh, more eggs than the older one, the worker ants will just abandon her and go follow the new, new queen. So it's very much this functionalism that's at play. It's not personal. There's no loyalty to this ant queen in the ant world beyond she plays. It, it's the system which the ants are loyal to, just as the bureaucrat is loyal to the system. Okay, so let's move to the second part of this, the division of labor and the role of castes, because for ant societies are divided into castes. At its most basic, there are two castes. There are, well, we, let, let's say three. There are the queens who pr lay the eggs. There are the workers who build the nests, forage, and defend. And then there are males. The males are a slightly different group from the rest, so we'll deal with them later. But in general, ant colonies are predominantly female. You could say they are the ultimate gynocentric uh, social order. And some ant species have a rather primitive division of labor, according to caste. So the giant red bull ant from Australia is a good example of this. They have queens and they have the workers. And the workers tend to hunt for food alone. They are solitary. They don't work together as a team. And each of them is pretty much the same. They will go out, they will hunt, and then they will bring food back to the colony themselves. It's very individualistic, in a sense, for this ant colony. But this... This is a very simple version of it. If we look at some of the other ant species, we'll have more of a sense of um, the complexity of division. One of these is produced through dominance hierarchies. Now, this might be quite surprising, given what we've been saying about ants essentially serving the system and having very little will of their own. Because certain ant groups, like Ondontomachus bruneus, do have political conflict of, of a sort. So you'll have the queen who lays the eggs, and then the workers. Now the workers have their own stratification within this colony, because the bigger ones, we'll call them soldiers for now, but the bigger ones, they will engage in, they will try to intimidate other workers. They will perform certain rituals. They'll start shaking. They might try and put themselves on top of a smaller worker. They will shake their heads and so on. And what this does is it's essentially telling the other worker, don't come this way. Why? Because the ants which are closest to the brood, to the, to the eggs and the larvae, have the highest status. But, well, at least in this colony. And so the ants who are maybe a bit bigger, but also who have the ability or the instinct, let's say, to make this sort of performance, are able to scare off subordinates. Now, this has maybe three levels. So 
you have the ones at the top who are closest to the queen, who are maybe the biggest and strongest. Then you have some others who are on the exterior of the nest, or just to the edge of the net, I sh nest, I should say, the peripheries. And then finally, you have those outside who are foraging. Foraging being the lowest of this cast. So you can see this is a, a cast system which is developed through um, competition and domination. It's not through biology, and it's not through... Um, it's not through allocation, we might say, or age. It's determined by who can do this. Stance. I think there's no violence here. The primary way of establishing your dominance is getting somebody else to accept your dominance through social rituals and performances. Essentially, Essentially, I think the getting them to recognize your superiority, like to believe you're superior at the very least. That's probably the wrong way to put it for an ant, but it's that sense of I accept your superiority. You don't force me to. I accept it. And the very performance of a superior role is often able to produce that in someone else or in another ant. And maybe that's also the case in reality too. If you take authority in a situation, people are more likely to accept your authority. Whereas if you are trying to coerce somebody into accepting your authority, tends not to be as successful in the long run. So that's one way that these ants divide themselves into castes and uh, their division of labor. You also have, um, let's, go, let's come back to this page for a second, in a second. You also have what are called temporal castes. And this is probably the most common form of differentiation between workers. So you have, if we go back to here, so you have your embryo and then due to um, environmental factors, also the age of the queen, she will either lay uh, eggs which produce more queens or that produce workers. This is the key decision point here, right? It goes one of two ways. Th those are the two fundamental castes. The queens alone can reproduce. They only have that ability. So again, use sociality. Workers, they do have ovaries, but they are often dormant or sterile. Uh, there's an exception. As some workers are called gamer gates, which I think is just uh, hilarious. And uh, these ones can lay eggs, but they often are not fertilized. And so they become males. And so males are actually ants that lack chromosomes, which again is uh, meme worthy. But the, yeah, so this is the key fundamental division, queen and worker. But then the workers in most ant colonies do not come with an assigned role or are not forced into a role or accept a subordinate role. They just have a role instinctually. And this is through um, age. Age seems to be the determinative factor or correlative factor. So young worker ants will be near the queen and the other eggs and pupae. Of course, they've just been essentially born, right? They've come out of their egg, they developed into larvae, they went, they kind of cocoon themselves, and then they come out as fully fledged ants. And so once they're first emerged, they will attend the mother queen. They'll groom the eggs and micro larvae, making sure they're at the right temperature, moving them about, about the colony nest if needs be. They will roll and carry eggs, as I've just said. They will help adults uh, become free from their pupae. They will also groom the pupae and they will roll and carry them. So these seem to be the main functions of workers in their earliest days. Then they maybe move a little bit further from the nest and they will roll and 
carry mature larvae about, groom them, and exchange oral liquids. This is this is uh, key to ants. Ants, um, what would you call it? There's a there's a proper name for this. I think it's tax. I'm not gonna even try. Basically, ants will feed their young through regurgitating. So, like a penguin, right? A penguin goes out and catches a fish, keeps it in its gullet, and then when it's ready to feed its young, it will regurgitate it into the young's beak. Well, it's the same with ants. The when they're larvae, they cannot go and get food themselves, so the ants will carry it back in their mandibles and keep it in their mouth and then regurgitate it out. So these ones, I guess, are doing that. They may have got it from another ant who's come back with some food, and then they're going to give it to the larvae. But then finally, near the periphery of the nest and outside, ants will be doing a lot more work. They will be retrieving prey and other kinds of food like leaves. They're going to guard the nest from predators and other competitors. They're also going to guard the food sites, places where they have uh, good resources. They will excavate the nest and build it and repair it. They'll forage and they'll defend. And so you can see a movement from the center of the nest to the, to the exterior. And there's a number of theories behind this. One of them is that as ants, ants uh, you know, have longer to live, maybe they just wander off and they go further and further away from the center. Another is more evolutionary related. So I think it's between one and 10% of ants who are foraging for food and outside the nest will die in any one day. That's a really high proportion if 10% of your ants are getting killed. And so it's not advantageous to have the young going out and foraging because you're actually killing off the future of the colony. It's much more evolutionary advantageous to have the oldest going out. So you get this dynamic where as an ant ages, it moves beyond the nest and then it does the jobs which are the most dangerous towards the end of its life when it's uh, when it is more expendable, you might say, for the system because there's a ready-made replacement waiting to go through the same process. It's also incidentally why queens are laying many eggs. Some species, like the army ant, the queen, is, I think she can lay up to two to, two, let's just say two million eggs a month. So that's the kind of rate that she needs to be reproducing to maintain and sustain her colony, which to be fair, in those sorts of ants, I think it's, they can go up to, to 20 million, so it's a lot. But again, see, so this, this is why they're called temporal castes as well. None of these roles are intrinsic to the, to the worker ant in this colony, as in none of them have been born with certain physical traits to do one of these jobs better than the others. Rather, I, th I think it's more, these are functions that they can perform as they go through life, that they can change their role within the colony and do a new thing in a way that's advantageous to the survival of the colony, i.e. in terms of their age. And in a way, we kind of have that, right, in human societies. We don't tend to stick with one job throughout our lives, certainly not in our current system, many of us will change. And as we grow older, perhaps we develop new skills and experiences. And within an organization, we might take on more and more responsibility as we go. There's a certain comparison there to be made. But ants also in the more complex and the most pure eusocial forms also have physical castes and this is where they probably 
you know, they just, they're very clearly distinguished from uh, most mammals in that many of the ants will be uh, physiologically adapted to certain roles within the society. So if we go back to here, you'll see that after the decision point is between queen and worker, then there'll be another decision point in terms of worker development, either between a minor, uh, th this, this isn't quite accurate. You can either have a minor worker, so the smallest workers, you can have a soldier, also known as major, and the very biggest ones are super majors, or super soldiers. And these are leafcutter ants who are one of these types of highly complex and truly social ant colonies. And you can see here the, the, the casts in play. So down at the bottom, you can see very small ants. These are worker ants, minor worker ants. Then you get some which are a little bit bigger. These might be soldiers. And then up at the top on the the not on the this image on the side, but on the the one with wings, that's a male. And then you have some of these are super soldiers, and I think they might be queens as well. And you can see on the right the size difference between a soldier ant, a super major probably, and a worker. Now, why why do they have some of these big distinctions? Well, a soldier has many advantages for the colony. Its hard head, so it's going to have quite a hard, flat head, is very good for defense, for blocking, for uh, clogging up the entrances to the nests, and it's well protected. They have very sharp and big mandibles, these... Uh, I guess the teeth or tusks at the front, very good for fighting with. And they're much bigger, they're much stronger, so they're more powerful than your average ant. So they're going to be, in general, they're very good at defending and fighting. It also lends to hunting. So if they're trying to take on other insects or maybe small animals and birds, they're going to be your shock troops. They are also good at... Um, weaving. So some ants, weaver ants, build their nests in the trees. And a soldier ant, given its strength, is much better suited to holding the leaves in tension while they're being weaved together. I, 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 think, I think also as well, the, the soldier ants, they... So they don't just work alone, they work with the other workers. And their superior strength will allow smaller ants, together with these soldiers, to move objects back to the nest. Dead prey, branches, leaves, etc, etc. So they, they provide, I guess, the muscle within the colony. But they're not enough. You need the workers. You need the workers who are able to do the mundane tasks, who are able to feed the larvae, to look after the queen, who I go out and scout and identify food, and so on. And in leaf cutters, this is most clearly seen, because the leaf cutter. Well, this leads us to. Is it going to be um. Uh, yes. So this this is the, this is what what we want to see. So, the leaf cutters. They are, um. They feed off fungi. There's a certain kind of fungi which produces lumps and bumps. I think you can see some of the, the white kind of flossiness on there. And these ants eat that as their form of nutrition. And so what they need to do is cultivate this fungi to survive. How do they go about doing that? Well, they need to cut down leaves and essentially leave it as mush for the fungi to absorb. And that way, the fungi is able to produce this stuff. So what the leaf cutter does is, well, the large super majors, they will cut down the branches. Then the majors may carry them and chew through certain bits of it, chew through the leaves. And then finally, the smallest ones will be able to um, 
chew it up and feed it to the to the fungi. So the big ones can't do this bit, but the small ones can't get the, the branches. So together they work as a good team. At the same time, you're seeing that the fungi is becoming part of the system. They have essentially developed an, an agricultural society where this is their food resource. And so they, they cultivate the fungi in a certain way. They help it to grow because it plays a role within their system. Without it, they couldn't survive. Other ants have um, their own livestock, you might say. So uh, the honeydew ant farms aphids. Now aphids, that when they eat, they produce a special sort of liquid or dew, which the honeydew ant feeds off. So what they do is they'll bring back food to this, to the aphid. They will supply them with leaves and, and so on. And the aphid will produce this juice and the honeydew ants will eat it. They will also, so say this, the honeydew ants want to move somewhere else to build a new nest to find more food. They will carry the aphids with them to their new nest and keep them in there. So it's very it, it's a very strong relationship. It isn't just uh, haphazard or by chance. They're, they're treating them like we would treat uh, sheep or cows, right? We use the cows to get milk, while they use it to get honeydew. Certain ants will also have relationships with uh, termites. So there's a species of termite who will build a nest and will allow ants to occupy half of the nest. This is a, a, a mutual, of mutual benefit because the ants are able to protect the termites from other ants which eat those termites. But at the same time, the termites produce certain forms of food which the ants will then eat. They tend not to cross over the boundaries within the, the nest. They'll have very fixed kind of territory, but they won't fight and their, their indwelling together allows them both to thrive. So, um, oh, and th there's another, there's another uh, special kind of ant. Here we have it. So these are the repletes, and they're a kind of soldier ant, but you can see that they've got an extended gaston. This is the back of their, their bodies, and essentially, they are living storage units. So you've got a, um, essentially the worker ants will bring it food. This ant will then consume that food, eat it all up and store it in its uh, belly, let's say. And so when the colony is struggling for food or the eggs need food or the larvae, this ant will be able to share that out again and, um, drain itself with nutrition, with the nutrition. So you have ants which are physically adapted and designed to certain tasks within the colony. And this is key to the colony's efficiency. And I have a, here a picture of Jacques Ellul. Many of you will know. He argued that in the modern age, human societies have moved towards seeking efficiency as an end in itself, that we try to make all our processes better and better, quicker and less resource intensive for a better product. And so we do this with everything. And the more we do it, the more specialization is required because, okay, you've solved one problem, you've managed to get more efficient at one area, but then you come to realize, oh, there's this factor, there's that factor, there's another variable in play here. And there's this all these interlocking aspects of the environment that if we want to achieve something, we could be, we need to master. And to do that, we need to think about our efficiency. And so you see the division of labor uh, percolate out. With the, uh, with the ants, we've seen that you can get temporal casts, that you can get uh, casts of dominance, but the physical casts belong to those ant colonies which 
we might say are the most efficient. Why? Because these ants have, through biology, are shaped as or, and well adapted to certain tasks, much better than your average worker ant who has to do lots of different tasks. Because of their specialization, they're able to do these tasks quicker and more efficiently than one that can do all of them. And so this allows for the colony to sustain a larger system. They can have more ants within their colony and thus grow and grow and grow the system. It's a never ending cycle. So you can get these uh, leaf cutter ants, if we go back, they can exist in colonies of 20 to 50 million strong. Put that in context, the UK has 60 million odd people, right? These ants can sustain a 50 million uh, strong colony. And that's possible because of their division of labor. Whereas your red bull ant, so that giant red bull ant, could get nowhere near that number because it doesn't have the specialization. It doesn't have the physical, uh, the physical specialization required to be efficient and thus to have excess um, produce, excess capacity for the growth of the system. So you can see that um, specialization is key and division of labor, which comes with that, but or is is possible with that, is key to maintaining and growing a system. And given that managers and the managerial world we live in is all about growth, all you ever hear is, you know, the economy needs to grow. We need our health service to grow. We need all of our things to be expanded across the world until we have a global system. That specialization and more and more division of labor is the way to go about that and at a certain point you have to start wondering are we going to see something like the physical casts that we do in the ant colony certainly in something like a brave new world there are certain casts of human designed for certain jobs we've already got genetic engineering and talk of super soldiers and things like that. Well, where does that come from? That idea comes from the ant colony. We see it in films all the time. Uh, and, you know, the, the super soldiers, the, but then also those who are dedicated to intellectual pursuits and to planning and so on. Somebody like Julian Huxley wouldn't have gone quite into the genetic uh, modification angle but he was very much one for a eugenic program which distinguished between those who had intellectual and creative ability and thus should be given uh, higher roles within society and those who did not, who should have no opportunities in society. It certainly makes sense if you want a more efficient system to have different uh, physiological and mental capacities tailored to the performance of various functions that will help to maintain the system more efficiently. But how do ants kind of perform their tasks? What is it that makes it possible for them to do so? Well, the key to the, the kind of ants operation is communication and particularly it uses pheromones we'll be able to see uh, these are the the i guess the chemicals uh conveyed primarily through smell uh, that can convey a lot of complex information and nuanced and subtle information amongst a group of ants the best way to kind of explain this is in terms of foraging so for several ant species, it might go something like this. A worker ant is sent out, but sent out is the wrong term. Let me be, let me clarify, let me start over. A worker ant goes out from the nest 
looking for food. It finds something which it recognizes as being a food source and returns to the nest. But in the process, it secretes a liquid at regular intervals or perhaps all the way. And this liquid will produce pheromones. When the ant returns to the colony, if it's it will it will try to get the attention of other workers to go back to the food site and go and collect the food essentially now this is determined by a number of factors such as the strength of the pheromones if the ant saw something which looked really good the pheromones it produces will convey that they will be stronger and they will have that sort of information in them if not it will be weaker, and so less ants will be inclined to go to that food site. The ant would need to perform a variety of other gestures, such as head wiggling, to convince them to go. But let's say they are, that it smells good. Well, the ants together will start off on the trail, and they will head towards the food site. As they go, they will themselves... Uh, lay out their own smell and as they get there they will get some stuff and come back but they will come back on the margins of the route if you think there's a central column going a central road along this trail they will come back on the peripheries leaving their own scent and as they do so they're conveying to other workers how much food is left is it still good to go and so on Eventually, you get a sort of rush. More and more ants are going because they're being told, there's food here, it's really good. But at a certain point, a, crit a critical mass is reached. There's not enough food to get anymore. It's declining. And so the ants will start wandering away and returning to the nest. And less ants will go until none. This in part is also because the pheromones will be dissipating in the air. And so on. And so what, what's really interesting about this um, process of the ants going to the food site and back and recovering the food is it's an emergent phenomenon. There is no controller. There is no design uh, plan that the ants are following. There is no manager who's telling them what to do in this situation. Rather, the ant goes, has a certain response, and this response uh, stimulates other ants to go in turn. And it, through the individual actions of the ants, each responding in its own way according to the context, they're able to achieve something which none of them by themselves would have been able to do. The little scout ant couldn't have brought back the bird carcass by itself. But with these processes in play, they are able to achieve that in a way that wouldn't be possible. And maybe the best way to think of an ant uh, and its decision making is in the following way. When an ant has a stimuli, so it sees a moving object, it has a binary decision to make. Well, it either recognizes it as, in this case, a friend of the colony by its odor, or as an enemy. And then it must make a decision. Do I attack it? Do I let it go? In the case of the foraging, the ant has a decision. It sees something and it's, is this something which is food? Is it not? And some scholars have kind of suggested, well, we should think of ants as having a pre-packaged algorithm, set of algorithms within them, a set of codes which determine their behavior in a given context. So if it sees food, it does X. If it sees danger, it does Y. And so it's not, it's not like, oh, it's thinking about whether there's food. It's rather the responses, a set of responses, sorry, a set of stimuli Will produce a set of responses and an almost automatic nature. So it's very much like a machine almost. But it's not like somebody's taught 
it, these algorithms. It's not like the queen has ordered it to do X, Y, and Z. They come prepackaged from birth. And that's true of all the ants. And so when these ants work according to their algorithms, because of the because of the way natural selection has produced colonies to have these sets of algorithms, they're able to produce things that none of them by themselves could do and that they're not intentionally trying to do. Let me give you an example. So these are, I think they're driver ants, which are a kind of army ant. And these are in South America primarily, but I think you get some in Africa as well. Or is it? The army ants can be in both, but drivers tend to be in Africa. And they don't have permanent nests. They don't have a nesting site. We might see later on why that's uh, advantageous. But the so they they will often form these temporary nests, uh, bivouacs as they're called, made up of their bodies, and they will move together in the, this great horde, measuring many millions across ground, consuming anything in its path, plants, animals, even you know humans can be at real risk if they get in the way in one of these. But don't worry, they're not very fast. They only go 20 meters an hour. But by themselves, the ants have no idea about kind of constructing something like this. Nobody, the queen doesn't say, let's do this now, and this is the plan we must follow. Each of them, according to a set, let's say the algorithms, perform kind of acts in concert. And the algorithms together are able to produce from each of the individual's actions this thing, which is able to modulate the temperature inside to ensure that the eggs and larvae are at a good temperature, is able to move in certain directions, is able to splinter off and have some who, well, some who are able to go and hunt off for a bit in a great column off and then return with food. It's a difficult thing to describe because I, I think human human societies don't tend to be like this at all. We often need somebody to direct us. We often need a plan at the very least. But these beings, these ants, they have no idea that they're doing this or that their actions are kind of part of this contribution. They just do their thing according to their algorithm or the like the algorithm appropriate to that ant at that moment. And collectively, they're able to produce something really complicated. There's no ant which thinks about the temperature in particular, but instinctually each of them react accordingly. And I think, again, this really lends to the idea of the superorganism, because our cells don't have uh, consciousness, as it were. They're not thinking about what they're doing, and none of them by themselves could has any sense of creating a human being uh, but from our cells and their each of their individual actions something immeasurably not just more complex but in a different stratosphere is produced i.e us with our minds and our creativity and our relationships the, our cells have no sense of that neither do the ants I should say, though, that ants do have a mechanism for learning. We could call this machine learning or AI learning. Here we see ants working in tandem or tandem running. And so an older ant, a worker ant, may take out another one uh, behind it on its foraging trips. And through this process, they will learn the techniques, what to secrete, and so on. So it's, it's algorithms that are becoming fine-tuned. Moreover, experiments show that ants learn to how to adapt to their, to their environment. So if a group of ants keeps foraging in a certain location, but is getting very little food from there, they won't go back. They'll stop going. 
But if there's an area with a lot more food, then they'll adapt to that and keep going to that place until they've exhausted it. So they they can pick up things. It's not like they, although they have these pre-written rules essentially in their makeup, biological makeup, these two can become adapted to their surroundings. Why do I have this drink on the screen? Well, I think there's a certain similarity actually between some of these emergent behaviors and what we see with uh, crazes, we might say, fads. Now, many of you know, will know this is Prime, which is a drink that is being produced by Logan Paul and KSI. Uh, I, th I think it's a, a sports drink, a hydration drink meant to be taken while you're at the gym and whatnot. And it's been a, a bit of a craze in the United Kingdom. People are desperate to buy these things. In many stores, you cannot buy them. And especially amongst uh, teenagers, I would say, uh, particularly white and Asian teenagers, this has been something that they all want to get their hands on. Not primarily for the drink itself. As I understand it, it doesn't taste very good. But because it's cool and there's a certain status to it and because, because they're so scarce. I think of something like, uh, well, in my, in my day, it was we had Pokemon cards were a wee bit like this, Crazy Bones, Beyblades, all these sorts of things. What, what's kind of in common? Well, to a certain extent, I think it's a little bit like the ant foraging. It goes out, it leaves its trail, and then this encourages another ant to go. And as that ant goes, that encourages another ant to go. Why? Because they're getting the message. There's food here. There's good food here. Come, come now, come quickly and get it. And there's a sense in which, and, and this is an emergent phenomenon. Nobody is, nobody is overseeing this process or organizing all these people all these ants to go and in the same way the popularity of a drink like this does not come from a manager who's instructing workers to go and buy this drink it's rather a group of kids have this drink and it's cool and maybe there's some marketing which supports that idea. The pheromones, right? The adverts are the pheromones. They say, this is cool and this is scarce. Go and get it now. And the kids, they see their friends get it. And they're like, oh, I need that. I need that. And so it's a domino effect. And more and more kids want to get this drink. I think we also saw it with Game of Thrones as well. Uh, the TV series. Before the last season... Uh, Game of Thrones was just so popular. Everybody that I knew was talking about it and saying, oh, have you seen it? Discussing the series, talking about just how awesome the show was. And if you hadn't seen it, you were a bit of, a little bit of a social outcast. I, th I think, um, again, it was this thing of most people I knew didn't get into it because of marketing, but because other people had said that it was a good show and but not just that it that they said it was a good show it's that almost it seemed like lots of people were saying it was a good show and so if you hadn't seen it you were in some way excluded from the group or uh, not in on it i think then you can see in these sorts of situations where there's a fad or there's yeah, where, where there's a craze for something, oftentimes it's not necessarily top-down organized, or at least the top-down organization isn't the whole picture. There is an emergent phenomenon where a group of individuals beam out to others that they need to come and do the, see this quickly, or it will be gone. And that's quite, I think that's quite important then if you're thinking about mass mobilization or cultural penetration, because you can go so far with um, 
top-down machinations. But at the end of the day, if you want to, to influence a culture or a lot of people, it needs to come through. Uh, there's a degree of in which emergent behavior has to be at play. If, it, if that's not there, then you may be able to achieve a lot, but you wouldn't be able to achieve something like the the hype around Game of Thrones in quite the same way. Now, of course, there might be things you could do to manipulate that, and we'll come to that shortly. But I certainly think that's a key part of human behavior. Um, another thing might be, um, let's think. Let's think what might be a good example. I, You know what? I think the, the funeral of the Queen and the Queen of Britain and the fact that thousands of people decided to walk past her column, uh, coffin. It, it, it wasn't like anybody ordered that. And there wasn't a manager's telling their staff to do this. There was no kind of instruction. People just felt the urge to do it. And the more people they saw doing it, the more people were encouraged and emboldened to do that thing. There was a mimetic quality to it. Now, I'm not trying to say this is identical to the ants. We don't release pheromones in that way. Although, although we do actually release pheromones. And it's quite important in sexual politics. But be that as it may, we are creatures of vision and of sound and of meaning. And there's a sense in which we we will do things because it seems to give us social status and because it's exciting, because it's scarce. And, but most importantly, because we're told this is what we need to do now. And if we don't, we'll miss out. That's what underpinned Prime and why it's sold. That's what's underpinned Game of Thrones. And in a different way, that's what underpinned the crowds that we saw surrounding the events of the Queen's funeral. So let's come to the final part then, and that's a nice segue into the manipulation of ant decision making. Now to understand some of this, we need to grasp how does a, a colony start and begin. And it's quite a simple process. Essentially a queen ant, a virgin queen, will typically leave the nest. She may have wings, she may not. Um, but if she has wings, she'll go on something called a nuptial flight and she will mate with several males. The males off regularly have wings and uh, and they, they may be from the same brood they may be from several broods to increase genetic uh, strength and diversity now once she has mated she will go and dig herself a, a preliminary nest and she will lay her first batch of eggs and these will probably be a they they will be eggs which will hatch quite quickly because they and they will produce small worker ants but the the reason why it's worthwhile to have these kind of stunted ants is because they could be produced quickly and thus can get to work on the rest of the nest and foraging and defending the queen and thus she is able to um, mate and lay more eggs in time thus growing the size of the growing and maintaining the size of the colony. Additionally, other ways that the queen can found a colony. Well, if there's already a mother queen, then her children, one of her daughters or a couple of her daughters may take part of the colony with them. They'll split off. They'll adapt themselves to the new queen. Alternatively, there may be a takeover. So, the old queen gives lays these eggs, the virgin queen is born, and she may kill the older queen, 
or the older queen will be abandoned by the workers and the new queen will become their queen. One of the more interesting ones, and I, I can't remember which species of ant it is, I'm afraid, but the when the virgin queens are born, the ant colony will split into two arms, two great big long chains of ants. And the virgin queens will each have to try to scramble along one of these arms. Each, each arm will be uh, subordinated to one of these queens. The queens that are successful will get along the arms, spread their odour over those ants, and then they will serve them, they will go their own way. The rest of the queens, they die off. In any case, what seems to happen is you have one or a couple of queens who produce uh, the colony from their own eggs or adapt them to themselves. And the way that they tell who they, the queen that they serve is through the odor, as I've said, the pheromones. And each ant will carry this smell with them. And that's how they can recognize friend from foe through their pheromones. So with that said, we're then able to understand how you can manipulate the ant. Because if ants are creatures working according to algorithms, if you can map what they will do by determining how they will respond to a situation, you can then manipulate the ant to act in ways that you want it to do. So. Our first example are the Amazon ants. Now, as you can see, this is a lovely picture of an Amazon ant. It's quite a ferocious looking form of ant. And it has very sharp mandibles. You can see these on the very front of its uh, face. I guess its beak. These are very, very sharp. And what this means is that they are unable to rear and look after their young, their brood. Why? Well, for one thing, their sharp mandibles would pierce through the eggs and so kill future ants. They would also harm larvae if they were picked up and carried. But then even more importantly, when it comes to regurgitating food and feeding it, they can't do that, they would hurt the baby ants in the process. So by themselves, this species would die because they would not be able to feed themselves or feed their young. And remember, a truly eusocial society, the, the colony would look after its young. So how do they get round this? Well, they kidnap, they raid other species. So these ants, the Amazon ants, are essentially all soldier ants. What they'll do is they'll go to another colony and they will kidnap several of the eggs or larvae in that colony. And once they return them to their own nest, these will hatch. And because these new ants, these new larvae have no prior sense of the odor of their their own species they will only know the odor of the amazon ant these two up at the top consequently they will come to identify that odor with themselves they will think that this is their species and so and this in particular is their colony as such they will become workers for the colony, serving the queen, looking after her brood, raising the larvae, and producing more Amazon ants. They become what, I mean, essentially in the, in the literature, in older literature, the Amazon ants are slave-making ants. And these, these ants that they've kidnapped when they were babies, when they didn't know better, are slaves. 
Although, as you can imagine, these days people uh, want to question this language because it's problematic. So they use things like pirate ants. Uh, <laughs> but slavery is really what it is. Slavery is what it is. Now, at the very beginning of the process, though, because you might think, well, how does this colony ever start if it requires uh, workers from other colonies? How does the queen get it going? Well, typically, the queen, the queen Amazon ant, she will infiltrate another colony's nest, usually of a different species, and she will, through force and through her pheromones, trick the ants into treating her as their own queen. She will lay her eggs, they will tend to her brood, and then once the, the other once her brood is born and she has no more need of the work of the other queen's reproductive capabilities, she will kill the original queen and take over completely. So that's how they take over. They essentially are parasites who replace the original um, reproductive function within the system. And then to keep going, to grow and make well to maintain and grow they need to keep replenishing but because they can't reproduce the workers they must kidnap them so again you can see though that i mean although it's in some ways it's a pretty awful insidious uh, manipulation of other ant species at the end of the day it's just another system but the reason why these amazon ants have to to kidnap is that they themselves don't have the physiological capability to fulfill all the parts of the system. So they have to essentially take from outside things which will fulfill the rest of the system for them. We've already seen this with the aphids, with the fungi. It's just another form of caste. But in this case, the castes are divided by species within a common system. There is another manipulation, which may be even worse. Now, blue butterflies of various kinds will, well, they're parasitic upon ants. Uh, butterflies, although they're very pretty, are not the nice, peaceful creatures that we think. They can be deeply male malevolent. Indeed, I think there's a certain Lovecraftian element to some of these monstrous beasts. Nonetheless, a blue caterpillar, some of them will emit pheromones which will confuse the ants. They will think that this blue butterfly is a queen, a queen ant of their own colony because of the pheromones it's producing. Their eyesight isn't so good, so that, that helps, but more than that, it's the the pheromones are the primary form of communication, and they respond to them intuitively or in instinctively. So they smell this, they think it's the queen ant, and parade the blue butterfly into the nest. There, it will start eating the young of the ant colony, and then eating the rest of the ants. Essentially, it tricks the ants into letting it in, and then devours them. Other forms of blue ant, uh, blue butterfly, sorry. Well, when they're caterpillars, they'll do this. So they will, um, you know, it's just come out of its cocoon, or it, sorry, its egg, and it will emit this frequency this and these pheromones. The ants will bring it into the colony, and then it will start eating all of the brood. There are other caterpillars, though, other blue um, butterflies, which take a slightly different approach. These will also emit pheromones, convincing the colony that it's the queen, and it will be brought into the, the brew chamber. But there, it will not devour the rest of the colony. Rather, it will just keep living there and require that the ants bring it food. In time, this actually weakens the colony because the ants are bringing the food to the caterpillar rather than to the queen and so she becomes weaker and less able to produce reproduce but nonetheless 
uh, scholars actually think the second strategy is a much more successful uh, and long term. Well, it's much more successful than devouring the eggs because you have a constant stream of nutrition throughout and protection. Whereas if you devour the colony, you lose that in nutrition, you lose that protection and have to move on to another colony again and again. The key point here, though, the key is that because the ants respond to a certain pheromone in a predictable way, the blue butterfly and its caterpillars are able to manipulate ant behavior because when they emit the right pheromones, they can get the ants, due to their predictable programming, to act in a way which is beneficial to the butterfly and detrimental to the ant. I guess you could call it deception at its root, but I think it's slightly stronger than that because it's because it's working off behaviors which are almost rudimentary. And in a way, we can see this with some aspects of our online culture. So if we wanted to take the blue butterfly, which devours this to me seems a lot like fed behavior feds being uh, you know federal agencies uh, spies intelligence networks especially in america but elsewhere as well one strategy is to uh, infiltrate a movement and then destroy it from within in various ways the infiltration though happens by essentially giving out signals which indicate that you are one of the group's members or have the same ideas and values as the group. So if this is infiltrating a right-wing group, for example, perhaps they'll start saying things about, um, you know, there's too much immigration in this country, that we need a return to traditional values, a, an emphasis upon the sacred, that we need a replacement of democratic government and, and and so on and so on we've all seen the memes where it's taken to ex its extreme uh, but you know good feds will be able to to convince others through the the social media output by saying the right words and the right, expressing the right ideas that they are genuine members of the dissident right in so doing, they get brought into the inner circles, into the nest. And then once within there, well, they can destroy it in a number of ways. One is by, you know, uh, well, we've, se we've seen examples of feds pl planting ideas within a community and then getting them to act in criminal ways to destroy them. Another might be uh, causing uh, division within a community, drawing attention away from community leaders into back alleys, causing fights, so on. Another might just be frustrating their plans. But in general, that this is this seems to be it's like the blue butterfly. On the other hand, we have the grifter. Now maybe not all I maybe I'm being a bit harsh on Steve Turley here. Um, but let, let me go through the, the four here. So we've got Simon Parks, who is also known as Alien Man. In the 2020 election cycle, Simon Parks had was streaming pretty much every day, talking about how uh, Donald Trump, who you can see in the top right hand corner, uh, had a seat. You know, he had plans for um, revealing the in his in his view the election fraud and for kind of instituting, clearing out the deep state and, you know, regaining power, essentially. That he had it from insiders. He had knowledge from the army and so on. Now, of course, this all turned out to be nonsense. Uh, but, you know, that didn't stop Simon Parks. He's still streaming loud and clear. He's still got millions of followers. But... But he was able to get such a big following at that time because he was saying things which 
appealed to the audience. Did he really believe them? I don't think so. I mean, they were so outlandish what he was saying. When you look at it, like he knew a guy in the army who was telling him that Trump's going to kind of purge, purge uh, the deep state, and it, nothing ever happened. It's been falsified. His claims false, but he still says it. Why? Because he knows people will watch. He knows people will pay. Donald Trump, he himself was kind of in this vein. He was saying things which, I mean, well, let's be frank, he starts out life as a Democrat, a New York Democrat. He decides to become a Republican. He knows how to push the right buttons for Republican voters, for people, conservative people who have been badly represented by the Republicans for many years. He says things that they like and hardly does anything. But he keeps saying the things that they want. He keeps causing the cult, you know, getting involved in cultural wars and so on. But his policies, he doesn't do very much. He builds hardly anything along the walls. He does very little about education. Immigration, did he do much? Well, better than Biden, but that doesn't say much. Maybe foreign policy was his best area. But in general, he wasn't what he promised to be. And certainly when it came around to the 2020 election, he promised a lot. He pretended to be Caesar, and then he ran away. Steve Turley. Steve Turley, I don't think he's quite the same as the other two, to be fair. But when you watch one of his videos, he's relentlessly optimistic, constantly talking about how the right is going to sweep into power one day. You know, it's only a matter of time before the left loses. We're on the right trajectory. I remember watching a video of his about how, you know, the the victory of the Italian, um, the current prime minister, is it? Uh, the right wing woman who's prime minister. How this, you know, how in Europe you've got that there, and in France you had Marine Le Pen nearly winning. These are all signs that the right is going to win in the future. Well, either he's he's um, just relentlessly optimistic and <laughs> really believes that, or he's selling people what they want to hear. He doesn't. He he's a smart guy. He's got a uh, well, I was going to say he's got a PhD. That's no guarantee of intelligence, but he seems a smart guy from what I've seen. I don't think he really believes that Milani winning in Italy is a sign of right-wing revolution across Europe, especially given some of the nuances of that and what it means to be right-wing in Europe at the moment. But nonetheless, he's, he will kind of sell that to his audience. He's, he's able to use that to get money and to get followers. So he's delivering, I guess you could, if you want to put it in ant terms, He's giving the pheromone off, which will get him benefit, even if it's not for the benefit of those giving it. And then finally, Priti Patel, who was uh, Home Secretary of the Conservative Party up until recently. I guess last year she was Home Secretary. And she was constantly talking about dealing with the migrant crisis, particularly the um, folks that are coming across the English Channel in boats and uh, illegal immigrants, and staying in many uh, five-star hotels in the in England. They're getting put up. She said she would deal with this problem many times. The Conservatives more broadly have said they would reduce immigration many times. The David Cameron government of 2010 even went as far as saying that they would reduce net migration to tens of thousands. Last year, a million people came. Net, net migration was a million to the UK. So these people will say what their voters want them to say. They will tell them what they want to hear, all so that they can get their vote and for their party membership, for their money. 
I guess what I'm trying to say, and you know, you can contest my characterization of each of these if you like. There'll be others that I could have picked as well. But in essence, the grifter. Um, I feel bad calling Steve Turley a grifter. But essentially, the grifter is an individual or an organization which will... he That individual will manipulate a certain audience by sending out the right signals to receive income, power, and prestige, even though they're probably not to the benefit of those who are paying. Because, and this this is why I included Turley actually, because the situation is such that each of these four people has misled groups within the right so that they're unable to follow those people who can actually offer solutions, who actually appraise the situation in the right way, who it would be to the benefit of themselves to follow and to give money to and to you know, support politically. They are forms of containment, as we might say. They channel it in, they take you so far in a direction and then prevent you from going in the real dangerous direction for um, the current regime. And there'd be others as well that we could include. I, you know, like Andrew Tate would be another example. So, so I think I think um, these are more like the blue butterfly caterpillars, who uh, send out the pheromones, confusing the ants into thinking that it's a queen ant, and then live off their um, their ignorance, live off the nutrition and protection that is brought to them by the creation of this illusion. There's a there's a really good quote in in this regard uh, by Ernst Junger, which I think kind of gets we get maybe is the more positive version of this. An individual can defy superior forces by making use of their rules without submitting to them. If you're able to understand the rules of behavior of a system, of the individual workers within that system and the functions that they play, you will be able to bend those rules. Well, not, not even bend those rules, but if you're able then to present yourself in such a way or manipulate the communication lines in such a way, you will be able to then benefit from that system without yourself becoming a drone within the system. You're able to turn it to helping you rather than those who it was meant to help before. There's, a, there's another sense in which this, this takes place though, right? We see this with the manipulation of political formula. So uh, for uh, Gaetano Mosca, a political formula is the key ideals or values or sentiments which underpin uh, a society's consent to a political elite. That was a poor way of explaining it. it it's essentially, it's the rationale or justification by which a ruling class is accepted by the majority of the population. And this is integral to its success. It can't just force everybody by violence to accept it. There must be some, um, there must be some acceptance on the part of the, the governed to the governing class. And in general, it comes down to a certain set of ideals or values or goals which the ruling class claims to fulfill by its governance. So for example, in, in you, you might have a ruling class which says, we will offer you health and comfort if you accept our rule, i.e. the British government. Most people will accept that. And, and not just the British government, the governing class, they say, we will give you a comfortable life if you accept us. 
most people want comfort, therefore they accept the ruling class. This might not be a kind of explicit logical chain of reasoning, but an implicit contract, you might say. So it corresponds to the fundamental ideals of the community. Well, in the modern West, one of these is human rights, one's choice, one's liberty, the dignity of the individual. These are part of the political formula of the West, that the governing class will uphold my rights. And most people, I think, to some degree, would be persuaded by an argument to do with rights. So, uh, and, and that's an, a key feature of a political formula, that it's, it's almost the, the foundational rock of all political argumentation. I'm going a bit beyond Moscow here, but I think it follows. It's a bit like um, Schmidt's, uh, you know, political theology. There's a certain set of ideals or values or feelings which do not need justification and are themselves a justification for action and for decision making. And so if you could persuade somebody on the basis of these values, you, you will be able to because people accept them as the foundational values. So let's take human rights. Most people would say, rightly, rightly or wrongly, that we should treat people equally and respect their human rights. Well, then various groups tap into that pheromone and they will, to use the kind of ant analogy, and they will try to claim certain, uh, in their view, it could be rights. We might say privileges for certain subgroups using the foundational. Uh, premise using the political formula to their advantage because they know it will produce a desired response it's very difficult to argue against somebody claiming that their the the things that they're claiming for as rights when you accept the premise of human rights at a in your very being conversely there'll be certain words which they which can be used to produce uh, which can be used in a similar way. So if you call somebody a uh, misogynist or a racist or a homophobe or a transphobe, nobody wants to be these things, right? Well, I'm sure I'm sure somebody does. But if somebody calls you that, your immediate response is not to say, yeah, sure, whatever because you know of the social stigma that's attached to these things, because you know what it's saying about your character, your instinctual response is to flee away, is to concede the point. And I think that's, so, so again, it's, it's the predictability of the behavior in response to a certain stimuli which can then be manipulated for achieving what you want. That's the key. If you know somebody's going to react a certain way to being called a certain thing, then you can use that to advance your own position. It's a strategy, it's a tool within your arsenal. So maybe some concluding remarks. And um, bef before we kind of come to the summary point, um, remember, folks, I put at the beginning of the stream, there's a pinned comment. I want your best uh, puns, uh, politically related ant puns. So far, let's see what we've got. Uh, not very much. Vingle's given us is an elephant an ant. Nord Huger has given us can't. I feel like you can all do a lot better than this, guys. Come on, come on. There's some very obvious ones. I'm sure you can do it. Um, and yes, please send super chats, comments, and so on. And uh, I'll address some of those at the end of the stream. So this guy, many of you will know him, Yuval Harari. He is, I don't even know what he is really. He's a, I guess he calls himself a scholar. He's associated um He's associated with the World Economic Forum. I think he's uh, seen as one of their intellectual lights within the movement. He's written various books. Uh, um, I have one of them over here. 
Homo Deus is one of them. And uh, it's a, um, I guess it's his kind of history of humanity and the cultural developments within it. Now, one of the things that he has been arguing for is that, well, it's funny because he'll say it's descriptive and prescriptive. But um, in his view, human society, we've been living through a humanist age. Before we had a kind of superstitious age where we believed in the gods and they did, dictated morality. Then we moved to a humanist age where morality comes from inward feeling, what I want, what I, my will is determinative of the moral order. And actually, if you look at somebody like Spengler, there's there's not too much difference in the, the fundamental point being made between uh, classical and Faustian civilization. But Harari will say we're entering a new age, the age of data or dataism. Essentially, human beings are sets of algorithms. We behave according to uh, predictable processes. This is already being seen with something like Amazon. When you buy something on Amazon, it tracks what you're buying and it will make you recommendations based on what you have already purchased before. And the more you purchase, the better it becomes at identifying the kinds of things that you, you want to buy. It tailors it to your experience. The same is true of uh, streaming services like well, YouTube, you'll see recommendations for videos that are um, of a similar theme to those that you watch. So I know I know for a fact that many of the people who watch this channel will also watch uh, Academic Agent, Distributist, uh, The Prudentialist, unsurprisingly, uh, because we're kind of talking about similar-ish areas. Uh, Scott Mannion would be another one. I, I can see it on the statistics. The um, It's also taking place in medicine. So various technologies are being used now, which can read what's going on in your body and preempt the, a situation. So for example, Angelina Jolie, she didn't have breast cancer, but because a computer analyzed her body and made a prediction or a I guess, what would you call it? A It drew, it drew the conclusion that there was a, a likelihood that she could catch breast cancer or, you know, have breast cancer. She got a mastectomy. So it was able to direct her to a certain course and procedure um, based on its reading of her body and its calculations. So for someone like Harari, he sees this as the first step towards a... A culture which is fully immersed in uh, dataism, computers and AI reading our data, and thus cultivating our lives accordingly. Deciding what should be done to us in terms of health, deciding what kinds of things that we should consume, what we should use our talents to produce, and thus manage all of human life accordingly. Because at root, we're all our algorithms. He'll say something like that. We're all just a set of algorithms. Of course, for Harari, he sees this as inevitable. And as such, he thinks we should therefore do these things, that we should build this technology because it's inevitable that we'll build this technology. I don't need to tell you how circular and banal this reasoning is but it's very effective because it's seen as neutral if it's just a scientific prediction that this is going to happen then it's not like he's uh it masks the fact that he's actually arguing for us to do it to become this sort of society what you can see then is this sort of understanding of human beings essentially sees them as like ants. That although we might have all these complex reasons for doing X, Y, and Z, at the end of the day, they can be mapped by a machine. 
they can be predicted by a machine and thus we can optimize and make human beings more efficient for production and consumption within a global world order we can control all of the variables because they're all reducible to an algorithm and thus we can tweak it we are we become cogs in a machine we become the ant who exists solely for the good of the system itself now i think we can see immediately that there are a few few problems with this view beyond the you know the question of whether somebody should have such control over a system one of them is what's called the rebound effect which i believe was kind of coined in 1865 I can't remember who came up with it, but some of you will know this. It's about the unintended consequences of actions. So, for example, perhaps you have some insulation built, kind of put into your house by the government because they want to reduce your energy bills. Well, it turns out that if you reduce the, if you make a house better at keeping in heat, that doesn't necessarily reduce somebody's energy consumption. Perhaps they will, instead of turning down the heating, they'll just open the window if they want to be cool. They may just wear less clothes. They might even use that money and energy into building a conservatory. So what you've ended up with is but you haven't actually reduced energy consumption and the price or, or the amount of money somebody's paying for energy by making it more by making the energy more efficient you've actually then just encouraged them to go and spend kind of spend up to the amount they already were to use use the same amount again because you've freed it up this is an unintended consequence of the policy another one is in scotland at the moment they've they've raised the price of uh, alcohol in Scotland quite considerably to try and reduce alcoholism. But what it's done is it hasn't reduced alcoholism at all. There seems to be no improvement on that front whatsoever. Rather, it's just pushing more people towards poverty because they're spending most of their money on the alcohol now and so have very little to feed themselves. So the rebound effect essentially illustrates the idea that you might have a really great plan and you might think it will produce one set of consequences, but in practice, it ends up producing another. And this is because the, in, the calculations involved, the way somebody's analyzing the situation doesn't include how the change in circumstance will alter a person's actions they see it as like okay after this process is complete the situation that the decisions are being made in hasn't changed but something has changed quite fundamentally the process itself has produced that so when we come to kind of this management of all the variables okay even if a computer system could map all the algorithms could it really predict these sorts of ir what we might call irrational behaviors or huge or, or the, the ways in which people would behave given the change in circumstance, given the actual process. Could it do that? I, I, I'm not sure. I leave that as an open question. Certainly humans are very bad at it, which is one of the biggest uh, kind of cases for conservative government where you don't necessarily implement radical reform um, given the given how difficult it is to work out the consequences of policy a second kind of argument against this is that he, when we look at the kind of amazon um, recommendations youtube recommendations or let's say a wine app's giving recommendations. 
they will tend to offer you uh, things which you've or things which are like what you've already experienced, things which are of a similar theme, of a similar tone, and so on and so forth. But when people have done experiments with wine tasting, for example, often when they don't know the brands, they don't know the prices or anything, the wines that they enjoy the most are the ones that give a novel experience, something they haven't tasted before. They don't want what they've already had before. They want something which is new and challenges the mind in some way, excites it, has a freshness to it, hasn't become familiar and stale. And indeed, much of human life is like that. Indeed, Twitter and YouTube and social media is catered to the constant deliverance of novelty. We crave something new. We want to discover the unknown. We don't want to have what we've already had before. Indeed, that's what leads to, in many ways, growth and development within our lives. That we don't just stick with what we've already had before. We, we're actually trying to encounter something which is... That, well, there's something mysterious about it, and it excites us. Let's just put it like that. And so these we're not as predictable as an ant in that regard, because actually we want that new thing. It's what drives so much of our of our economy, actually, is the search for new things to do. So you can, and, and many of us will change in the process. We'll start to have new tastes. We'll gain experiences and recognize what's good and what's bad. We become, it's, it's the way in which we actually determine who we want to be and what sort of lives we want to live is through exposure to unfamiliar circumstances. So if, algor if reading algorithms and predicting behavior relies upon regularity, human nature kind of goes against that, it defies that. And that, that and, but you know, maybe a computer could do that. Maybe when they develop these super AIs, it will be able to keep that stimulation in play. But I think this leads to the third, the third kind of distinction. And here I've got a painting by John, I think it's John Duncan Ferguson or Ferguson Duncan. Uh, I don't know where I've got the book, but um, this is a painting by him in 1913 of St. Bride or St. Bridget. It's at the National Gallery of Scotland in Edinburgh. I came across this a month or so ago and well, it just blew me away. I was stunned by this painting. At first, at my first time I saw it actually, the time before I, I kind of really, really saw it, I thought it was a wee bit superficial and, oh look, he's just trying to be a bit modern and out there by painting an angel with pink wings. How, how superficial. Actually, the next time I saw it, it just, it just had a, I just had a deep feeling of this is awesome and magnificent. Now this is something which has a which has expresses something deep about Christian faith and about the changing of the world, the relationship between the sacred and the natural. I'm struggling to put it into words because it was a it was a powerful sentiment. And in some ways, language almost boxes it down too much. But I couldn't get that from analyzing it in a scientific way or mapping it down to an algorithm of, oh, I responded to this in a certain way. The experience itself is so much bigger and broader. It goes beyond the material world. It's... Because, because a computer might be able to map, well, this composition of color and shape on a canvas produces this chemical response within my mind, 
And so if if uh, if we are able to reproduce that stimulation, we'll be able to reproduce the experience my, on a material level. But my, my point is, is that human life, our experiences are not just... It's not just material. The experience itself is on a personal level. It's... Um, Scruton talks about it in terms of when you look at a person's face, you don't just see flesh and blood. You see an individual. You look in their eyes and you see character. You see a perspective. You can't map that with science. You can't tell me where the, the consciousness is. You might be able to show me brain states, but you can't share with me the experience of another person or what it's like to to have a conversation with somebody else you can't convey the the aesthetic feeling produced by this painting within me and i'm sure there's painting for you paintings or images for you which send shivers up your spine a piece of music which just moves you so powerfully. The experience itself is 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 what's interesting here. It goes beyond uh, what's mathematically quantifiable. It has its own richness and depth. And so, so, so I think something like an ant cannot have that, right? It doesn't have that. It exists only for the system. It exists only according to a set of algorithms. And its life is determined by those prepackaged algorithms responding to certain situations with certain stimuli. It's, it's certain stimuli make it respond in certain pre-programmed ways. I just don't think that's true when it comes to these sorts of encounters to our personal lives. And I don't mean by that private, I mean the personal dimension of human existence. I, that can only be perceived through relationship, through, um, and, and because ultimately that's where truth, beauty and goodness belong, or at least beauty and goodness. You can't identify those scientifically. You can't observe them in the world with a machine or with a computer. But you can, you can, uh, as a human being, they're just a part of your experience. As Kant would say, we might say they're also almost presupposed in our experience. We couldn't have experiences. We couldn't have, or the, the, the kind of experiences we do, without them being presupposed as real. Uh, the same would be true of time and space. So I, I think that's the key difference. And that's why I think it's dangerous to reduce human beings to ant-like algorithmic um, creatures, which could be predicted because there's a level of there's a quality to human experience which defies this quantification and analysis. Indeed, for, for somebody like Kant, actually, uh, our experience, is, so although in the, the, you know, according to the scientific worldview of his day, which was Newtonian, all things are determined by causes, when it comes to our experiences, free will is presupposed in our very experience. We can't experience the world in another way. It's just part of it, right? When you go out and you, you know, do various activities, you're almost presupposing in your um, thinking about what to do that you have free will. So it's just baked in with how we experience the world. And that's because we also just experience the world with moral categories. 
It's not like I necessarily reason, oh, this is wrong and this is right. I just see it like that, right? If I see somebody beating somebody else up um, or robbing somebody, that might be a better example. I just instinctively know that's wrong. It's just part of my experience. So I, th I think um, these things really argue against somebody like Yuval Harari. And it, it, I mean, others have done much more extensive um, explanations of those points. And I appreciate that it was a, it became a little bit kind of mystical or an assertion. But that's because we're on the very boundaries of what's possible to say. Because if these things are just presupposed elements of our experience, they're just fundamentals of how we engage with the world, but they're not reducible to algorithms or scientific categories, then I think it's, um, then it's difficult to argue on that level uh, for that. It's, it's more, you just have to recognize that it's there. Um, yeah, so that that's, uh, I think that is all my slides. Yes, so let's see what folks have been saying in the comments. We have a bit of time for that. Uh, thank you again for tuning in, everybody. I hope you found that informative about ant social systems. And uh, yeah, please do send in comments, questions, super chats. All are very much appreciated. So uh, let's see. Um, hello, J. Green River. Hello, Vingle. Lord Inquisitor uh, Hashion. Welcome. Nord Huger. Good to see you. Very good videos on Lord Huger's channel. Everybody should go and check him out. I, li I like all these ants. Uh, very, very good. Very good. <laughs> um, Oh, is this is this in relation to the mole rat? Yes, I can imagine. I imagine he does. Uh, hello, Johnson and Duke Valentino. Good to see you, folks. Ah, uh, you still haven't watched a single episode of Game of Thrones. I I don't blame you. I I watched the first three seasons and then I stopped. I thought um, I'm halfway through. There's a natural end point here. This is a good time to finish before it goes badly. Um, but it's a very cynical uh, show. It's very much everything is reducible to the desire for power, um, the exploitation of other people. I think it's good if you like political thrillers, because that's really what it is. It's a political thriller within a fantasy setting. But its worldview is very reductive and cynical. And uh, it's probably not good consumption for the soul. Vingle, this seems like it gainsays elite theory. So th this is on the emergent phenomenon. I, th I think it, it, it can complement it. I, I, I think it's... Um, so, so for the elite theorists, the principal idea is that uh, society, human societies are run on a top-down basis. That uh, you know, there's the iron law of oligarchy of Michels that the small organized minority will govern the majority. What I said didn't really go against that that point. What I, what I was more saying was that certain movements within a culture, certain phases or crazes, certain men certain manipulations of the masses have to have a an emergent dynamic to them if they're purely top down they're not going to take off in the same way that if people are if people respond uh, because they see other people doing a thing and they want to be involved they want to imitate that's often a much more effective way of creating a large scale popular um, cultural movement. 
Now that can be manipulated by an elite, right? We see that with um, the use of influencers to, uh, so like in the prime example, uh, let's, let's get back to that. Yeah, so in Prime, you have various influencers saying they want to get this thing. You might have bots on Twitter or whatever also kind of shilling this. We know as well with the, the Prime situation that they're actually keeping stock back to uh, create a false scarcity. So it becomes even more cool to have it, even more prestigious to have it. So you can manipulate it in a using an elite theory sort of you, you know as an organized minority for your advantage so it doesn't necessarily argue against it but it cautions it cautions against treating everything as top down or at least ignoring the important role of emergent phenomena in directing people's actions now, I've, I've mainly spoken of the masses, but if you look at something like the uh, 2008 crash, you know, all these bankers uh, kind of making terrible deals based on dodgy subprime mortgages, they were all in on it, and they all were going in the same direction. Now, was this uh, directed? I'm, if it was, I have not come across that. But certainly when you watch something like um, The Big Short, it seems very much like an emergent phenomenon that everybody was just kind of going along with this. They thought it was the place to get the most money because others were doing it. You don't want to be left out. And then the whole thing crashed. So you need that within your modeling of the, the human system. Johnson being very, very edgy there. Uh, well done. I, I would not say he is a grifter. He is definitely not. He's a. Uh, he's if you if he was a grifter, he would be doing things a little bit more. Uh, he he has the talent to be a very good grifter, the academic agent. He's got the charisma. He's got the imagination. He's brilliant at coming up with ploys to get people interested in things. But the things he kind of says, and focuses on are not uh, grifter behavior. He won't tell you things he doesn't think are true. He might take up positions to cause a little bit of havoc, but he's not hes not a grifter. Uh, here we go. Here's some of the puns. Anti-fascism. Very good, Jofi. Uh, Anti-social structure. We've got a shorter one. Antifa. Anti sock, well, anti age and ant sock. I was thinking of others. You've got uh, Anthony Blair, <laughs> Mark Anthony, uh, Anthony Eden, just all the Anthonys, basically. Good to see you, Yiz. Always good to see you. Lovely to have you tuning in tonight. Is this the reason why rich and powerful people seek the most degenerate taboo things? They want something new, exciting, which they haven't had before. I definitely think that's a huge part of it. And in our, you know, one of the things that people have shown with social media, also with um, kind of porn addictions and so on, is that because we're so bombarded with dopamine hits, it actually numbs us. The stimuli becomes less stimulating over time and so to get the same dopamine hit we need to go for more extreme forms of entertainment more and more novel experiences and so you'll put and so they've shown that there's a certain pipeline from kind of very how to put it types of pornography which are relatively normal you know, heterosexual, to more and more and more fetishistic. And it's the same with social media as well. So there's definitely that aspect to it. It can be very, the hunt for novelty isn't just for novelty's sake, it's also because it's the only way to get more and more dopamine hits. You could, you could give a metaphysical response as well. 
that if you look at somebody like Augustine, he would say that our souls, they, they have a kind of infinite appetite and they can only find rest within communion with God or the divine. You'll see, you, you can see something with the Platonists as well who influenced Augustine. And so when we try to find rest within finite and temporal creaturely realities, they cannot satisfy us. They might give us a bit of pleasure for a moment, but their transience and their finitude means we must go on searching. And it's only when we find true communion with God that we can have peace and contentment. That would maybe be a metaphysical version of that phenomenon. Very good point, Johnson. Very good point. And I, I, th I think that's the thing. You know, I've, I've been wrestling with academic agent, and I, I should go soon because unpopular opinions will have, be getting started. Um, but um, he's got a, a competition on um, uh, for it, um, video essays. Get my words out. Video essays. Uh, one of them is on the problems with modern Britain. One of them is on explaining the importance of mythology and legend. And the final one is on what can we learn from the ancients? And I, I've been thinking about uh, certainly the latter two. Could I do something? And I've been really struggling with the second question because there are there are many people who have given answers to that, right? If you read somebody like Carl Jung or Jordan Peterson, mythology and legends, their importance is they kind of symbolically represent our, our psyches and they provide archetypes and narratives which show us what it how to self-actualize and so we can essentially you can reduce the mythology to Jungian psychology others like um well Kant and the early Hegel would reduce it to philosophical truths and moral truths that because most people are not uh rational enough or have developed rational faculties they need to be moved emotionally to experience the or be conveyed these truths through mythology but part of me thinks well actually the problem with these sorts of answers is they're reducing mythology first to something outside of itself but second they're unable to really capture the fullness of what it means to listen to a myth or to read a myth and engage with it imaginatively. And to even try and answer the question about its importance in some way misses, misses it because you, you're trying to justify mythology according to rationality and practical consideration, neither of which is the essence of mythology. So you're bringing it down to a different level and thus making it less than it truly is. So is the only way to convey the importance of myth through myth or through art in some way, which then again is difficult to do. It's difficult to do. So I think you make a very good point, Johnson. Like if, the, if these things do belong to a different sphere, if they are constituent of a higher mode of human experience and life than can be mapped by science and reason then maybe there is an ineffable quality to them when it comes to these languages and they can only really speak in 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 a language which isn't reducible in its own way maybe i don't know i don't know that's the problem I, there's something there but i'm, I'm not sure herlock Holmes, good to see you just joined may have to listen to the start is my name orange? Your name is not orange, I'm afraid. Uh, let me get let me get off this uh, horrible prime slide uh, to something more fun. Um, yeah, let's stick with that. <laughs> um, the painting reminds me of Agnes Slot Muller's John Fru Blidelil. Uh, well, I shall have a look at, for that after the stream. Uh, thank you for the recommendation.
and thank you for joining Lord Inquisitor. Very nice to see you. Antisocial behavior. Very good, Herlock Sholmes. And Biaki, hello, hello. Good to see you. I haven't noticed any Ledettes today, unfortunately, but we do. I have looked at the statistics. 4% of the audience are identified as female. So there are some out there watching this stream, either live or in the, the VOD squad, the video on demand. So hello to you, Ladette. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. I've I've enjoyed this. It was it was um I hope you can see it was quite different looking at Ant society from the chimpanzee one, but that it does have real benefit and can be instructive in its own ways. I, I think in particular to understanding the drive or, or the the tight connection between division of labor and specialization to maintaining and growing a system. The idea of a system which exists for its own sake. And then the ways in which you can manipulate um, a system if you understand how to how the constituent parts behave in response to certain stimuli, because then you can use that to your own advantage. You can take that stimuli and employ it so that the response you get will work to your favor. Uh, next week, uh, we're going back to, let's get off this, to mythology and science fiction. I'm going to be joined by Al Shayatori, Connor McHugh, and maybe one other guest. And we're going to be discussing the rise and fall of Anakin Skywalker, or rather the fall or rise of Anakin Skywalker. Uh, looking primarily at the prequels and its key themes, uh, there'll be discussion of its reactionary elements too. And then uh, the following week, I don't think there'll be a stream on the Tuesday. Um, it is Valentine's Day after all. And I want to encourage you, all, all you lads and ladies, to be going out there and meeting people and doing something else rather than watching my stream on Valentine's Day. But on the Sunday, I should be joined by Ferro. We're going to be discussing uh, the two of the, the intellectual and creative giants of the 19th century, John Ruskin and William Morris. Now, those two would have definitely been against reducing society to uh, a bunch of ants. And so that, that'll be quite interesting. So please tune in for that. Um, but yes, in the meantime, uh, please like and subscribe. Become a member, and you'll get to choose next month's topic uh, for one of the streams. And uh, yeah, please put your comments below. I'd love to hear what you think. If you drew any other conclusions or different conclusions, I much appreciate it. Till next time, may God bless you, whoever you are, wherever you are. Good night, friends. <laughs>